This video covers optimizing SEM imaging and is brought to you by the Michigan Center for Materials Characterization, MC Squared, at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. In this lesson, you'll learn the basic operating principles of SEM, become familiar with how sample preparation, user technique, and imaging parameters impact imaging, and develop an understanding of how to optimize SEM imaging for your sample. This lesson is intended to foster a practical understanding of scanning electron microscopy. Because of this, we won't discuss detailed theory explaining the various phenomena in the interest of time. If you'd like to learn more about the theory, please see the references at the end. As an overview, we'll start with a quick background on SEM, the signals used to generate images, and image characteristics in general. Then we'll discuss sample preparation, user technique, and imaging parameters, and how these affect imaging. Throughout this lesson, we'll examine real-world examples of SEM images that demonstrate the concepts being discussed. Finally, at the end, we'll recap the main takeaways. As a quick background, scanning electron microscopy is a type of microscopy that uses electrons to probe the surface of a specimen. With this technique, a focused beam of electrons is scanned across a specimen. Based on how the beam interacts with the materials in the specimen at each location during scanning, we can create a grayscale image where each location scan corresponds to one pixel in the final image. SEM can reveal topography and regions of different compositions, phases, crystal orientations, or densities. Here is a basic schematic of a scanning electron microscope. In the most general case, a specimen or sample is mounted and loaded in the SEM chamber. The electron beam exits the objective lens and hits the specimen, generating various signals. Certain signals can be collected by the detectors, which are not shown here, and then converted to an image on the computer. When the electron beam hits the sample, it interacts with some of the atoms there to generate different types of electrons and x-rays. The volume that generates these electrons and x-rays is called the interaction volume. The size and shape of the interaction volume can vary depending on the sample composition, surface topography, and imaging parameters. While the interaction volume generates x-rays and electrons, we'll focus on the electrons in this lesson. We can detect two different types of electrons in SEM scattered electrons and secondary electrons. Scattered electrons are electrons from the incident beam that change trajectory from interacting with the sample. Scattered electrons have high energies near that of the incident beam. Among scattered electrons, backscattered electrons, BSEs, are ones that are ultimately scattered backwards. Oftentimes, a primary electron is scattered numerous times before exiting the sample and being detected as a BSE. Since BSEs have higher energies, they can escape from deeper in the sample, typically from 500 nanometers to a few microns. Secondary electrons, SEs, are valence electrons that have been knocked out by the incident beam. They have relatively low energies. While SEs are generated throughout the interaction volume, as are BSEs, SEs can only escape from close to the sample surface, typically within a few nanometers because of their low energies. There are three types of secondary electrons, termed SE1, SE2, and SE3. SE1s are generated by the beam at the point of impact. SE2s are generated by scattered electrons further from the point of impact. And SE3s are generated by backscattered electrons when they hit other parts of the SEM, such as the objective lens or chamber wall, after they exit the sample. SE1s and SE2s are generated in the sample, while SE3s are not. Now that we've reviewed SEM, let's go over some general terminology used to describe images before we discuss SEM images specifically. Noise is any unwanted signal. This is a signal that doesn't represent what's being imaged, like the SE3s we just mentioned. When there is a lot of noise, images appear very grainy or speckled. Resolution has two distinct meanings. The first, sharpness or clarity, refers to spatial resolution which is how much detail an image contains. The spatial resolution of SEM is around one or more nanometers, depending on the machine. If the spatial resolution of an SEM is five nanometers, for example, that means features as small as five nanometers can be distinguished from one another. Images with low spatial resolution appear blurry at normal viewing conditions, even when in focus. The second definition of resolution refers to the pixel count or dimensions of an image in pixels, 
A common resolution for SCM images on our machines is 1280 by 1280 or 1 1.6 megapixels. Images with low pixel resolution appear pixelated at normal viewing conditions. Brightness refers to how much an entire image emits light. If the brightness is too low, the image appears dark, and if it is too high, the image appears washed out. Contrast refers to how the parts of the image differ from each other in brightness. If contrast is too low, the image will appear gray, and if it's too high, pixels are either black or white with no shades in between. For the best image quality, we want a high signal to noise ratio, high resolution, according to both definitions, and appropriate brightness and contrast. The first aspect of optimizing imaging has to do with the sample itself. Appropriate sample preparation is key to capturing high quality images in SEM. In general, your sample should be clean, non-magnetic, and conductive. If your sample isn't clean, the features you're interested in may be obscured by contamination. Magnetic samples should be avoided because magnetic fields distort the electron beam and can result in poor images. Finally, your sample should be electrically conductive to prevent charge from accumulating on the sample surface, which interferes with imaging. If your sample is very insulating, it should be coated with a conductive material. In special cases, it may be possible to image magnetic and or insulating samples. Please consult with a facility's staff member if you would like to explore this option. Coatings are materials that you can apply to the sample surface. They are used most often to improve electrical conductivity of insulating samples, making it possible to avoid charging or the accumulation of electrons on the sample surface during imaging. Various coatings can be applied using the carbon coater or sputter coater at MC squared, the most common being gold. While coating insulating samples is often necessary, coatings cover the surface and may obscure information to an extent, depending on the coating composition and thickness. This is important to remember if your features of interest are near the surface or if you plan on using EDS for element identification. With EDS, you may pick up signal from your coating. For these reasons, it's generally recommended that you try imaging a sample before coating it. Here's an example of uncoated insulating polymer tablets compared to the same material coated with gold. We can see charging on the uncoated polymer tablets. In general, charging degrades image quality. Besides sample preparation, following best practices when operating the SEM is important to achieve the best image quality. Your sample should be securely mounted to the sample holder and the sample holder should be securely attached inside the SEM. If the mechanical connection is poor, the sample can move during imaging, which can result in blur or artifacts, and a poor electrical connection can cause charging. Before taking any images, you should focus at greater than 2000 times magnification even if you're imaging at lower magnification. In general, always focus at considerably higher magnification than the magnification you intend to use for imaging. Focusing at a given magnification before taking an image at the same magnification will result in low spatial resolution from poor focus. This is a very common mistake for beginners. When you focus, you'll likely notice that the beam needs to be centered and astigmatism needs to be corrected. Center the beam and correct astigmatism to the best of your ability. You can watch the video on basic operation of the test scan Mira 3 SEM for a demo of these procedures. Finally, while you're acquiring images, minimize mechanical vibrations as much as possible to minimize blur and artifacts. If you notice abnormal vibration during imaging, please report it to facility staff. Now we're on to imaging parameters. The first imaging parameter we'll discuss is working distance, WD for short, which is the distance between the bottom of the objective lens and the focal point. When your sample is in focus, the focal point is on the sample surface, so working distance becomes equivalent to the distance between the bottom of the objective lens and the sample surface. Using a smaller working distance increases spatial resolution, making images appear sharper and more detailed. Working distance also affects the depth of field, or how much is in focus. With a larger working distance, more of your sample surface is in focus, but the focus isn't as sharp. Normally, you want to use a small working distance to maximize resolution. An exception to this is if your sample has large topographical features, then you may want to use a larger working distance so that the features of different heights are in focus.
Here's a series of images of tin spheres that show spatial resolution decreasing as we increase working distance. The image becomes slightly blurrier at larger working distances. This decrease in resolution is most noticeable at high magnification. Here's an example of depth of field changing with working distance. At low working distance, 10 millimeters, we have a shallow depth of field. The edge of the fracture surface is in focus, but the smooth side of the paper clip is out of focus. When we increase the working distance to 50 millimeters, the fracture surface and smooth side of the paper clip are both in focus. The next imaging parameter we'll discuss is the detector used to collect the signal. Let's start by going over the acronyms and positions of four typical SEM detectors. The Everhart Thornley detector, ETD, is positioned off to the side at an angle. The through lens detector, TLD, is typically located above the objective lens. This detector may also be referred to as the in lens detector. The backscattered electron detector, BSD, is normally retracted and comes in from the side, just below the objective lens. It's shaped like a ring so that the electron beam can pass through the middle. Like the BSD, the detector for scanning transmission electron microscopy, STEM, is retractable. The STEM detector is disc-shaped. It requires a different specimen holder and sits underneath the specimen. The Everhart Thornley detector is the default detector on most SEMs. If you don't change the detector, you're likely using the ETD. The ETD is most often used to detect secondary electrons. Because secondary electrons are relatively low energy, a slightly positive voltage is applied to the detector in order to attract secondary electrons. BSCs that happen to be directed toward the detector and SE3s can be two sources of noise when imaging secondary electrons in the ETD. Secondary electrons are generated throughout the interaction volume, but only escape from the region closest to the sample surface because they have low energies. Since the signal is generated from a small volume, the spatial resolution is high, and because this volume is at the surface, the ETD shows surface details and topography very well. Areas where the beam interacts with angled surfaces, edges, and protrusions often appear brighter. This occurs because there is less material surrounding the uppermost interaction volume, which allows more secondary electrons to escape and reach the detector from those regions. When this happens with edges, it's called the edge effect. This image shows the edge effect on a pore in a nickel alloy. Because the ETD is off to the side of the sample, there can be highlights on regions closer to the detector and shadows on regions further away. This tends to give a three-dimensional feel to images produced with the ETD. With this micrograph of tin spheres, we see shadows in the upper right-hand corner because the ETD is positioned in the opposite corner. If an SEM has another detector in addition to ETD, it's often equipped with a backscattered electron detector. As the name implies, the BSD detects backscattered electrons. Because backscattered electrons have higher energies, they can escape from deeper within the sample. So a larger interaction volume generates the signal, which results in lower spatial resolution. Heavier elements tend to scatter electrons more strongly, so areas with these elements generate more signal than areas with lighter elements. This causes heavier elements to appear brighter with the BSD. Certain backscatter detectors have segments whose signals can be manipulated to maximize diffraction contrast or compositional contrast. Because of the location of the BSD, the amount of signal that reaches the detector is strongly dependent on working distance. At lower working distance, the collection angle is larger and more signal is collected. Because the ETD and BSD are the detectors you'll most likely use, let's take a minute to compare and contrast some images taken with both detectors. Since secondary electrons are emitted from the sample surface and backscattered electrons are from deeper in the sample, the ETD shows more of the sample surface, while the BSD shows more of the depth. These pictures show a nickel alloy sputter coated with gold. Beneath the gold coating on the surface, we can faintly see a particle with the ETD from the BSCs that happen to enter the ETD. However, with BSD, the same particle is much more noticeable.
The ETD mostly shows the gold surface, while the BSD shows the particle underneath the coating. We mentioned the edge effect earlier, which is where edges and sharp protrusions appear bright with the ETD. We can see bright edges around this pore. With the BSD, we don't see a difference in brightness between the edge and the surrounding area. Also note the edge is clearly defined in the ETD, but the edge in the BSD appears blurry. This has to do with the larger interaction volume of backscattered electrons, which gives lower resolution. Heavier elements appear brighter in the BSD compared to lighter elements, which appear darker. If we zoom in on the same area as before, we can see compositional contrast in the nickel alloy with the BSD. The lighter regions are secondary gamma prime particles, which are composed of heavier elements on average than the darker matrix. Let's continue with the last two detectors. The through lens detector is similar to the ETD in that it is typically used to detect secondary electrons. In fact, the electronics that convert the electrons to a computer signal are shared between the two devices. Like the ETD, a small positive voltage is applied to the TLD to attract secondary electrons to the detector. Some microscopes have a high resolution mode that directs electrons inside the column where the TLD can collect the signal. This setup maximizes the signal and minimizes sources of noise, such as SE3s. Because of this, high resolution mode with the TLD can produce images with better resolution compared to the ETD. So, why don't we use TLD for all secondary electron imaging? The main limitation is that there's a minimum magnification of roughly 2,000 times. Since it's often helpful to look at a sample in low magnification before going to high magnification, you may want to use the ETD on your sample first. Here's an example of how an image taken with the TLD in high resolution mode compares to one taken with the ETD. The high resolution mode image on the right is sharper and shows more surface detail than the ETD image. Last but not least, we have the stem detector. STEM in an SEM is similar to TEM in that samples have to be thin, usually less than 100 nanometers thick, and the beam passes through the sample. Because of the voltage limitation, STEM in an SEM is often lower resolution compared to TEM, though STEM is capable of resolving nanometer scale features. The STEM detector uses scattered electrons to generate an image. These are electrons from the beam that pass through the sample. Most stem detectors are divided into concentric segments. The center segment is bright field, which detects electrons scattered the least. Bright field shows the most diffraction contrast or contrast related to crystallographic orientation. The middle zone is dark field, and the outer zone is high angle dark field. Heavier elements scatter electrons to a higher angle, so the higher angle dark field zone provides the most compositional contrast. Now that we've talked about the TLD and STEM detector, let's look at some images created with these detectors. This series of images shows an aluminum alloy imaged using the TLD and two modes in STEM, bright field and dark field. With the TLD, we're detecting secondary electrons from the surface, which appears relatively smooth and featureless. Next to this, we have the same view in bright field mode using STEM. Now we're looking through the sample and we can see a lot more information. There's a grain boundary running vertically that was almost invisible using the TLD. We can also see the copper and zinc rich precipitates throughout the sample in bright field and dark field mode. Because these precipitates are heavier than the aluminum matrix, they scatter to higher angles. This causes the precipitates to appear dark in bright field mode, which detects electrons with low scattering, and bright in dark field mode, which detects electrons with high angle scattering. For the most part, the same features are visible in dark field mode as in bright field mode, but the colors are inverted. High angle dark field mode looks similar to dark field mode. The next imaging parameters is accelerating voltage, which is the voltage difference between the microscope filament and the anode. The anode is a positively charged metal plate that extracts electrons from the filament to form the beam. Accelerating voltage can typically be set between 1 and 30 kilovolts. High resolution SEMs often allow voltages in the range of hundreds of volts. Theoretically, higher voltage increases the signal, but it can also introduce more noise. 
Higher voltage creates more BSEs and SE3s. With the ETD, these can be sources of noise. If everything else is held constant, increasing voltage makes the interaction volume larger. As a result, spatial resolution decreases and signal comes from deeper in the sample. High voltage increases localized heating, which can damage delicate materials such as polymers or biological samples. Beyond a certain voltage, depending on the sample, beam damage will occur. If you have a delicate sample and are unsure about what kind of voltage it can tolerate, start with a low voltage. Here's an example of how changing accelerating voltage affects the depth of signal. When we increase the accelerating voltage, we see alternating layers of copper lines in the semiconductor. At 5 kV, we see some remnants of copper lines running vertically. At 10 kV, these disappear and we see the horizontal lines. At 30 kV, the visibility of the next layer of vertical lines increases as we see deeper into the sample. This is an example of beam damage on a tablet of polymer spheres. From left to right, we have the before and after pictures, which show beam damage as a crater in the center of the tablet. If we zoom in, we can see the crater more clearly. Next up is beam current. Beam current is a measure of the total number of electrons per time in the beam that probes the sample. Beam current is often in the range of picoamps to nanoamps. On some SEMs, beam current is referred to as beam intensity and may be given in arbitrary units. Using a higher current increases the signal. While we want a lot of signal for imaging, other considerations come into play that necessitate limiting beam current. For example, higher current beams tend to be more difficult to focus to a small spot. Since a smaller spot size is better for high spatial resolution, low current is often preferred for high resolution imaging. Whereas accelerating voltage determines whether or not beam damage occurs, beam current affects the rate of beam damage. If the voltage is high enough for beam damage to occur, increasing beam current increases the rate of beam damage. Beam current affects the extent of charging. Using higher beam currents results in more severe charging. Charging disrupts the electron beam and can cause the sample to shift during imaging. It may be difficult to tell if you have minor charging, which can result in slight distortions or horizontal streaks in images. Severe charging, on the other hand, is often very obvious and results in high contrast, choppy images like the one shown here. To wrap up, let's go over everything we discussed in this lesson. With SEM, we use a focus beam of electrons to image materials and to obtain information about surface structure and composition. We collect two main types of electrons to generate an SEM image, scattered electrons, oftentimes backscattered ones, and secondary electrons. Backscattered electrons reveal compositional contrast and escape from deeper in the sample. Secondary electrons escape from the surface and show surface details. For optimizing SEM imaging, we considered three things, sample preparation, user technique, and imaging parameters. These are the key takeaways. Start with a clean, non-magnetic and conductive sample and coat if necessary. The images you take can only be as good as your sample. When your sample is ready to go into the SEM, mount it securely. Before you start imaging, focus at high magnification, center the beam, and correct astigmatism. During image collection, minimize vibrations. At some point, you have to select or adjust imaging parameters. We discussed four imaging parameters, working distance, the detector, accelerating voltage, and beam current. Working distance affects spatial resolution and depth of field. Generally, we use a small working distance because it gives higher spatial resolution. The two most common detectors are the ETD and BSD, which detect secondary electrons and backscattered electrons, respectively. We also discussed the TLD and STEM detector. The TLD detects secondary electrons and the STEM detector scattered electrons. Characteristics of images produced using each detector directly relate to the type of electrons detected, the detector geometry, and how the detector is positioned in the SEM. Accelerating voltage and beam current are characteristics of the electron beam. These affect the signal and spatial resolution. High accelerating voltage or beam current can adversely affect the sample by causing beam damage or charging, respectively.
Here are some additional topics related to SEM imaging that may be of interest to you. Finally, there are many references and articles available for more information. Here are just two that we have selected.